Welcome you back to Pac-12 Football Media Day. Kyle Whittingham, reigning two-time defending champs from Utah, batting leadoff here in Las Vegas at Resorts World. Kyle, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Thank Season you. number 19. I know, I can hardly believe it. Num uh, number 30 at the university. Unbelievable, so unbelievable. That's, uh, that's an anomaly. But yeah. You must have started blessed. coaching when you were seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Every season, you've been doing this for a long time, Coach, and we're going go up to go open up to questions from the media in just a minute, but I want to start with you. Every year is different. Every team is different. There's new challenges, new faces. So can you kind of start with broadly, state of the program right now, and what's unique about this 2023 squad? Yeah, I think we're in, uh, in a good place. Uh, of course, we've got our quarterback coming back, Cam Rising, tremendous player, uh, absolute leader of our football team. He's the alpha dog of our team. Uh, we're strong up front, as we usually are. You know, we've got line of scrimmage. Uh, should, uh, should be very good for us. Uh, we've had some good recruiting classes that we've stacked up the last few years. So, so uh, cautiously optimistic going into the season. And no worries about being picked third. I just want to have other, that on could there. Could care less. Yeah. I could care less. I just want to answer that right off the bat. Doesn't matter. Okay, we'll open up to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Okay, right here in the middle. Hey, Coach, uh, resiliency is going to be a big key for you guys this year as you're going for a three-peat within the Pac-12. Cam Rising coming off a big injury, Brad Keithy coming off an injury. I was just wondering how those, uh, those guys are progressing as we get closer and closer to the season. And I want you to dote on your guy, Jaquindon Jackson, a little bit. Switch from a running back or a quarterback to a running back, and it's really made an impact for you guys. What's he looking like out of camp? Well, first of all, uh, you're right. We had some uh, very serious injuries last season. Uh, Cam and Brant are both right on track uh, with their rehab. Uh, Brant is obviously a couple months ahead. He had the surgery a few months uh, prior to Cam. But uh, we fully expect Brant to be ready for the season. Cam's going to come right down to the wire. I mean, it's, will he be ready for the opener? We'll, we'll have to find out. But, but uh, you know, we still got, what, a month and a half before uh, that happens, or I guess less than that, a month and a week. But, uh, you know, and Jaquindon, Jaquindon was a great um, – asset to us as a running back when we made that move last year that really seemed to give us a little bit of a a uh, in, infusion of energy and and uh, and he he really did a great job of taking to that position he embraced it it's one thing to to change positions but if you do it and embrace it and don't do it reluctantly your odds of success are much better and that's exactly how we handled it and uh, it was a huge uh, part of our success that second half of the season okay we'll go here in the front on the left uh, morning, Coach. Um, last year, you talked about you know, winning big games out of conference, kind of fell short against Florida. But in terms of you feel like Utah really winning a big game on a national stage out of conference, do you still feel like that needs to be done, or do you, do you feel like it's pretty solidified? Well, you know, it's obviously good for the conference anytime one of our members can can uh, you know win those marquee matchups uh, the nationally. Uh, you know the ones that have national implications, but but overall, I think you just judge the season as a whole. That's what we've always done. Uh, no one game is really any more important than the other in that regard, uh, especially in conference. I mean, they're all important, but uh, you know, I think that this conference overall is in a great spot. We ended with six ranked teams last year. I think we're going to open up with uh, probably those same six uh, teams ranked in the top 25 uh, in the preseason. Uh, we've got quarterbacks, uh, you know, all over the place in this league. So I think the Pac-12 is in a very good place right now, and and uh, the conference is uh, really strong, and we're poised, hopefully, for a for a run at the uh, CFP with one of the teams in the league. All right, we'll go second row here, middle right, uh, Michelle. Michelle Gardner, Arizona, Arizona Republic. Coach, can you talk about the quality of quarterbacks in this conference? It seems like it's the best since maybe you've been there, and how exciting is it to have this? group of quarterbacks in this conference yeah it's uh, it is the conference of quarterbacks without a doubt uh, just for an example uh, our guy cam rising who led us to the last two pac-12 championships is not even honorable mention you know preseason pac-12 which is crazy to me but but that speaks to the level of the quarterbacks that we have in the league uh, not no disrespect to the guys that are that are the you know the, the preseason guys because they're very uh, deserving and and uh, you know have played exceptional football but but uh, I think, you know, the only time that it really compares to where the league is right now is in quarterbacks is when we first got in the league, and it was Marcus Mariota and, 
USC, I think it was Barkley that USC had. So there was there were some really good quarterbacks that uh, when we first entered. But but uh, I think you're right. This is probably the strongest group that we've ever had as a whole. Coach, you referenced the state of your program. You know, 19 years of the head coach here in this program. How do you look at the state of the game, the state of this league, as the conscious of this league now? Yeah, I think we're in a great spot. Like I said, I mean, anytime you can have half the league ranked in the top 25, you know, at the end of the season and then going into the next year, uh, I think that's strong. I don't know if there's a league in the in the country that uh, maybe the SEC that, that has that representation and and that uh, strength where you you got half your half your league ranked in the top 25. Far right, second booth. Coach, good afternoon, or good morning, rather. Uh, Mike Makita, Reddit CFB. Uh, in the past year or so, your two, two of your biggest conference or non-conference rivals, Colorado and BYU, have had uh, big changes in their situation. How do you see those change in that rivalry with either of those two schools? Well, obviously, Colorado has, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, thing that's taken place there. I mean, the whole roster has been flipped over, and, and with the new rules and the way things are structured, uh, you know that that's just you know how it is, and so Coach Sanders has uh, really uh, shaken the tree there, I guess you could say, and, and brought in a bunch of, of new faces, new players, and and uh, you know he's a, a sharp guy and, and doing things the way that you know he, he sees them needing to be done, and and uh, so you know it's a work in progress. We'll see what happens and see how it shakes out, but but uh, you know he's uh, done a great job. And then uh, of course BYU going into the uh, the big, the Big 12 is is a you know big uh, move for them, and and uh, you know we, we went through the same thing what 12 years ago now, and and so uh, you know we don't play them this year. This will be the second year in a row that we don't play that game, and so it's a it's a rivalry, but uh, not quite the same feel that it had maybe 10 years ago, uh, or 15 years ago when we were in the same league, and and it had uh, conference implications and all that, but. But certainly, still, uh, you know, one of the better rivalries in the country. Uh, we'll go second row here on the end. Hi, Coach Lisa Horn, PigskinGrind.com. I know you're a great defensive mind, and our friends east of the big money sometimes don't give the. So I, I can't hear you. Can you speak? Okay. This is hard. Can you to hear, hear me now? Okay. Better. Yeah. Great. Um, our friends east of the Mississippi tend to be a little. Uh, negative about Pac-12, the perception, per perception of its defenses. I know you're a great defensive mind. There's a saying, a, a casual saying, that great, uh, good offenses win games, but great defenses win championships. Uh, two questions. Number one, do you agree with that statement? And number two, if you had your choice between a great off offense or a great defense, which one would you choose? Well, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, we still feel like we play some good defense at Utah. Uh, I believe you got to have, you know, a quality defense to compete for a championship. But, but if you look at the analytics, just the pure analytics, offense has really taken the the forefront as far as, you know, what is more conducive what, to to winning football games. And I think it was 50%. Uh, you know, offense is responsible for 50% of your outcome. Defense 35%, and special teams 15%. And and again, these are just numbers that I've read. So in that regard. Uh, in order to win a championship, you better be pretty good on offense. But, but obviously, you know, being a defensive-minded guy and, and having a defensive background, that's always going to be important to me personally. But, but uh, you got to change with the times, and I think we've done that at Utah. Our offense has gotten progressively better through the years. Uh, Andy Ludwig, our offensive coordinator, does an exceptional job. We got a great quarterback, and so uh, I think that uh, maybe the old adage is not quite as true as it used to be. And, and in fact, uh, you know, offense is probably, well, statistically, is more important to winning games than defense, at least uh, on paper. We'll go third row right here in the middle, Steve. Yeah, Coach Steve Croner from the San Francisco Chronicle. Everybody's talking about the, the six teams that are ranked, and deservedly so. Of the other six teams, which one of those six do you think has a chance to get up into that top? That's a great question. Uh, I think all are capable. Uh, you know, both Arizona schools, uh, you know, this transition at, uh, at Arizona State with the coaching staff, so they're just getting things going there. I think Coach Fish has done a great job at Arizona, gaining some momentum. Uh, got a lot of respect for Coach Wilcox at Cal, uh, excellent defensive mind. Uh, Stanford, Coach Taylor, you know, brand new coaching situation there. Uh, who else? Uh, Washington State, you know, I think they're on the right track as well. And then we already talked about Colorado and the big transformation that's happened there that, that I think the whole nation is sitting back and anxious to see what, uh, how that turns out. All right, over here on the far left, Mark. Right, 
Mark Hulkin, WeRSC.com. Coach, this is probably going to be the last time you get to play USC and UCLA and Los Angeles. How is that going to affect recruiting for you in the future, knowing that those families won't be able to watch their kids play in L.A.? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, to be determined, you know, I think it certainly will have an impact on, on recruiting. Um, you know, without a, a presence in Southern California, that's been a, a real focal point of our recruiting for years and years. And so I can't give you a great answer other than we'll just have to see how that shakes out. But, but uh, you know, it, and we're still going to recruit that area. We're not going to stop just because of, of what's happened. And, and uh, we're going to uh, continue to rely on that area. But, but uh, report back to me in a year or two. I'll have a lot better answer for you on, on how that's going. We'll stay over here on the left. Morning, Coach. Uh, Jake Merrifield, What's Bruin Show. Uh, getting back to your defense from last year, you struggled early in the year, halfway through the year with, in the L.A. schools, the Florida game with the rushing defense, and then you guys seemed to get it together really well, and then the second time you played SC, you really shut them down. What do you attribute that change to? Was it level of competition or, or stuff you, get, you guys did? What do you think? I think we had uh, a lot of guys that started to uh, really come of age during the season. We had some young guys in the lineup, uh, particularly in the secondary. And uh, I think as the season went on, those guys got better and better and, and more acclimated and settled in. And, uh, you know, I just think we, we gained momentum, as you said, defensively throughout the course of the season. And, and I think it's probably primarily for that reason, guys getting experience and uh, getting comfortable with what we're doing. Over here on the far right in the booth. Coach, you uh, mentioned Ta uh, Coach Taylor at Stanford. And when he was with your program, how much did you see that capacity for him to be a program builder? Did an excellent job at Sac State, a program that doesn't have a whole lot of traditional success, and now coming in at Stanford and kind of uh, rebuilding that program. Okay, I didn't hear the first half of the question. It's, it's the yeah, acoustics in here are horrible. <laughs> with with uh, was Coach this a Taylor, nightclub? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, with uh, with Coach Taylor when he was in your okay. program, how much did you see the capacity for him to be somebody who could be a program builder the way that he's been? At gotcha. Sac State? Okay, Coach Taylor's an outstanding football coach particularly an uh, exceptional offensive mind. That's his forte. Um, he was wildly successful uh, for a lot of years at the high school level. Uh, did a great job at Eastern Washington before coming to us. Uh, subsequent to us, he went over to uh, Sac State and tore it up there. So I think uh, they've definitely got a, a guy in place there that, that uh, is going to make that program you know, better. And not, not, no disparity against Coach Shaw. I think he did a tremendous job as well. But, but uh, Troy Taylor is a... Uh, a very bright mind in uh, in the game, and uh, you know if you just parallel that or, or or look at what he did at Sac State, if he can do that same uh, project at Stanford, they're going to be very good. Standing up here on the left. Eric Lampkins the second, Culver City Observer. Um, coming off of consecutive Pac-12 championships, it would be completely easy to get complacent. How do you go about setting expectations for your team and keeping them uh, energetic? Yeah, I think it's uh, very easy. I mean, nobody's ever three-peated in the, in the Pac-12, so that's one, that's one thing right there that, that we can uh, accomplish that uh, has not been done. Uh, still have not made it to the college football playoffs. That's something else that we're, we're uh, looking at. And so there's a lot of things uh, that we have yet to accomplish uh, at Utah and are excited about uh, get another opportunity this year to, to try to uh, raise the bar even higher. We're about to have Cam Rising and Cole Bishop come out and join us on the set. I just got to ask you, you mentioned about Cam, but can I ask you about Cole? Led the team in tackles a year ago and is one of, the, obviously, the undisputed leaders on your defense. What do you admire about the way he plays the game? What does he bring to your yeah, team? Yeah, Cole Bishop is a, a tremendous football player, um, very physical style of play. Could be a linebacker, you know, if we put five or ten pounds on him. He probably could be a, a tremendous linebacker as well. But but uh, from the minute he set foot on campus, it was very apparent that the guy was just a pure football player and loves the game, trains like a madman. Uh, there's nobody that outworks him in the weight room, uh, studies film constantly. Uh, and, you know, to do what he's done in just the two years that he's been there is pretty remarkable. Coach, when you look at your team trying to go three in a row, when you talk to them, it seems like some of these guys are like, we came back for a purpose, right? The last dance, whether it's Brant or Cam or Yasmin. What have you noticed about what they've done to the younger players around them coming back with this type of urgency that they have? Yeah, all three of those guys you mentioned are great leaders for us. Uh, they are extremely focused, this team. Uh, and it starts with those guys, those upperclassmen. Uh, we have a 
uh, a saying in our program that, you know, when the, uh, the recruits come in, you know, you will become us. We won't become you. You will become us. And that, and the, and the young recruits get sucked up into that philosophy, into that, and that mindset. And uh, our older guys do a great job of setting the example and, and uh, setting the expectations and then demanding that those younger guys uh, measure up to that. We've got time for one more with the coach before we bring out the student athletes. Dennis here in the front row. We'll bring a mic to you in much a second. <laughs> coach, um, Dennis Freeman, uh, news for us online. Coach, uh, in regards to NIL, do you see that as a negative or positive in regards to college athletics? I think the concept of NIL overall is a big positive. I like seeing the players uh, getting some monetary reward for, you know, for, for their abilities and what they're doing and, and uh, things like that. It's a little bit out of control right now. There's no guardrails. There's no parameters. And so uh, I think until, and I don't see that changing unless Congress steps in. That, you know, that's my own opinion. I don't know how you get this thing uh, in a situation where it's regulated, unless Congress does it, that's, you know, from my viewpoint. And so uh, happy to see the players getting, getting uh, more benefits, but somehow it's got to be reined in and, and put some, some uh, re regulations and, and parameters on it. So it, it, right, right now, I don't think it's sustainable. The way that's going right now, I don't think it's sustainable over the, you know, more than the next few years. And so in order for it to be uh, something that's going to be, uh, you know, uh, plausible, I think that Congress will step in. And, and, and I don't know if they will. I don't know if they're interested in doing that. But you tell me how else it's going to happen. It's not going to happen at, at the NC2A level. They, they can't do it. And, and uh, you know, it's right now it's just state to state and, and uh, so much uh, inconsistency in it right now. So we've got to get some consistency and, and some, uh, you know, just some, some uh, guardrails in place so it uh, can, you know, be a better situation. But, but the concept is great. How about that? All right, and I'll remind everybody that Coach will have time in the breakout room following this. But thank you, Coach. It's been great to spend you some bet. time with you. Looking forward to watching your team. We're not going to have to wait that long to see just how dialed in you guys are because you got a big one August 31st. We do, Against Absolutely. Florida. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Good luck okay. this season.